Welcome in to chopping block update number one. I am working with a new mic that is sitting here at the table to try and reduce some of the echo that goes on in this room. We have hardwood floors and I feel like when I'm filming without like a carpet in here, it definitely reverberates off of the wall. So if the audio is a little bit different than it normally is, I apologize, I am testing this out. I've had this mic for a while and I tested it a little bit and I don't think I loved the quality of it, but I think I had it a little bit too close and I just, I really haven't had too much of a chance to play with it. So we shall see how this ends up working out or if this video even makes it or I scrap it and redo it. I will go ahead and link the video up above where I did the initial chopping block video showing the 74 different items that were going into the chopping block. In today's video, I have 30 items that I wanna update you guys on. I just thought it would be fun to sit down, put some of this stuff on and tell you why I've decided to keep it or whether or not it is going to go to a new home or just simply be thrown away because it's past its expiration date. I'm trying to take a more pragmatic view about how I'm using my makeup, how I'm purchasing makeup, and I know that there's two categories. There's a category where I buy makeup just to review it on my channel, not that I'm big, just that that's what I've created for myself and trying to build up my channel. And then there is makeup that I know I will get a ton of use out of outside of reviewing just in my personal life. And I want to make the distinction moving forward of those two categories. I started my channel in July of 2022, and I think it takes a little bit of time to build up momentum and to decide what it is that you really want for the vision of your channel and that you have time to do. I do work full time. It's something that I wanted to start just because I thought it was fun and I started really getting into makeup right around 2020, again, after loving makeup when I was much younger. So my approach to kind of reviewing all the items that were on my chopping block was because I hadn't touched a lot of these in a while and I had consumed so much makeup in 2023 and 2022 just because I was building my channel and now I feel like I want to slow down. I want to review products in a very limited capacity that I think will be relevant and the other things I want to review because I think I will like them. And I feel good about buying more of those things in that category, things that I think I will enjoy personally. So when I was retesting all of these products, I was going into it thinking, what is it that I want to keep for me personally and not just for the consumption for consumption's sake or because I think at some point I might review it on my channel. However, having said that, there is three different categories here. One is I will be keeping the products because I really like it for my own personal use. Two is I will be keeping it in what I consider my kind of reference library in my closet where I keep a system of clear drawers of products that I think may become relevant at some point that I would like to talk about. And then the final category, of course, will be I'm going to declutter the product again because I don't think it has any relevance, because I don't want to use it, and then also and or it is expired and it probably should go into the trash. So I know that was a longer intro, but I wanted to kind of just give you guys some idea of kind of where my placement is in retesting these things and why I feel like the chopping block is important. I will probably not do a chopping block in future years because I think I'm approaching the way that I test makeup a little bit differently. But having gone through this exercise with my recent declutters and with testing these products again after letting them sit for so long has kind of refreshed how I feel about testing a product initially. So I am going to be putting a lot of this stuff onto my face today as I'm talking about it mostly the stuff that I'm keeping but not in every single case the first thing that I did already apply just to get it out of the way was my eyeshadow and I had a couple of eyeshadows on my chopping block and I have gone ahead and tested one of them so this one is the Saga of Freya palette from Odin's Eye I want to say this is probably the very first palette that I had from Odin's Eye and some of the shimmers tend to dry out a little bit so because this was the oldest one that I had in my collection and I honestly hadn't reached for it in probably over 12 months I wanted to pull it back out to see if this was something that I really enjoyed using or I was just keeping for collection's sake. And I have played with it a couple of times now and the quality seems to still be really good. The shimmers are still very moist. They still perform really well. I really enjoyed the looks that I was coming up with. And again, the quality was still really there. And some of these shimmers are just really, really delightful. Even some of the toppers in here, I was getting some pretty nice enjoyment out of, whereas I'm not typically a huge fan 
of toppers. So I am going to hold on to the Saga of Freya palette. That is the only eyeshadow palette out of, I think, the seven that I had put in the chopping block. So that's the only one I tested. The next one that I want to go into is the color corrector from Milani. It's the Conceal and Perfect in the shade Rose. I put this in the chopping block because it wasn't something that I found really worked. I found that it was a very thin formula and I didn't see a huge impact when I wore it, but I knew that it didn't disturb the concealer. It didn't make it look thicker when I put it on. So that's why I had held onto it. Plus I thought it was a relevant product, but because I've talked about it several times on my channel in different videos and because it's a liquid product and because I have other color correctors, I wanted to make sure this was something that was going to actually work for me or I was just going to end up passing it along to somebody. And while I don't think it's the most impactful color concealer that I have or have ever tried, I still really enjoy this for something very thin on the under eyes. Sometimes color correctors can really do a good job but that can lay pretty thick on the under eyes and definitely mess with the concealer, especially as I get a little bit older and the skin gets a little bit thinner. But additionally, I think that I'm color correcting a lot more or I'm finding the importance of it more now. I feel like my under eyes are definitely getting darker than they have in the past. So I enjoyed this the couple of times that I retested it. Again, I don't think it's the most impactful one that I have. I like the little bit of extra that it gives me and then I lay concealer on top of it and then I think it does a really good job even though it doesn't neutralize it kind of all on its own for me. So this one I am gonna hold on to. Let's move into primers. I tested two primers that I had in my chopping block and the very first one that I had was the NYX Marshmallow Primer. Primers is one of those categories for me that I have to be careful with, more conscientious with I should say because I don't typically use primers. And if I do use it, it's typically something that's doing something for me above and beyond what I can get from my skincare, setting spray, or maybe a more mattifying foundation. So in this particular case, while it has a very nice sweet scent to it and it feels to kind of smooth out the skin temporarily, I don't find that it has any real lasting benefit and it doesn't seem to lock down my makeup. And I've held onto this for quite a while. I, I think I've got this when it first launched. So it's definitely a bit older and it has a 12 month shelf life, but I am going to pass this along. This is not something I see myself reaching for and I have a ton of other primers and those ones I would like to pan or get more use out of. So this one I'm going to pass along. But one that I am going to keep is the number 28 Primer Serum from Hourglass. And I'm not keeping this because it was more expensive, although that sometimes is a factor in some of the products that I choose to keep or declutter. Decluttering something that was more on the expensive side is just trickier, is a little bit more difficult than something that you purchased from the drugstore. But in retesting this, I just loved the way the foundation sat on top of it. I felt like it smoothed out my skin, but it was also very hydrating at the same time. And there is something very kind of elegant about this formula. It also has like this eucalyptus or aromatherapy scent that I typically don't like, but I do find very pleasing in this product. It's a very silky feel as well. It just feels really nice on the skin. I do feel hydrated without feeling greasy. It almost feels like a hydrating formula with a bit of silicone in it. And I love the way that my skin looks too with it on. It just looks a little bit dewy and refreshed. It just looks very nice and healthy on the skin. It's also something that I, I feel like can help with some of the dullness on my face if I'm going in with no makeup at all. I feel like I got a, a renewed sense of appreciation for this particular product. This is just the mini, and I don't know if I would repurchase it due to the simple fact that I have so many in my collection, but I think I'm gonna pull this out and put this in a project pan. And by the way, a project pan video update is also coming that I'm going to film sometime this week. But as far as the hourglass goes, I am gonna hold on to this little guy. I wanna move on into mascaras next because I, I tested five and I wanna say there was about seven total. So I still have two more that I'm testing. Maybe it was six. I'll go over the ones that I'm not gonna hold on to first because I did cut these down quite a bit. Overall, I need to be serious about mascaras because even though something is really nice, it's one of those categories 
categories that I will reach for just the select few that I like. And even if I like something, I need to love it when it comes to mascaras. That's just the way that I am. Because with me, I feel like there's just no compromise when it comes to mascara and what I wanna wear on an everyday basis. And I feel as though I've been testing so many lately and I just wanna get away from testing mascaras because I wanna get back to the ones that I absolutely love. And in testing all of these, they all fell into the I like them category. None of them I disliked at all, but only one of them I chose to keep. So the very first one that I am gonna get rid of is the Can't Stop Staring Mascara from Give Beauty. I bought this mascara when it first launched, so I think it's definitely just time to let it go. I liked the way that it looked. I wanna say it's a tackier formula and it's kind of a medium weight. It gives a decent amount of volume, decent length. All the boxes here are checked with this mascara, including the wand style. The wand style is my preferred style, something a molded plastic bristles that are very short. But in this case, it just didn't wow me. It didn't knock my socks off. It didn't give me the most intense pigmentation. And if you guys hear me talk about mascara, I just like them intense. I like it length, but I mostly like volume. So that's really what I'm looking for. And I just re-upped on my favorite Beauty Bay High Key Mascara and I need to get some use out of those ones. So I'm gonna let it go. Not that it's bad. I held onto it through declutters in the first place because it was actually really decent mascara. But I think that's kind of what it comes down to is that it was just decent for me especially because in 2023 I found so many of my favorite formulas and so those are the ones that are getting grabbed so while this one impressed me it didn't impress me over those other ones another one that is over six months old is this one from Simi Hayes that I picked up at Sephora it's called the easy lash this one when I first picked it up impressed me quite a bit more it had a level of intensity that I wasn't expecting. It was a drier, medium weight formula that gave really good pigmentation. It was quite intense for what I was expecting and given this really small plastic bristled wand. And it was one of my favorites for a time. And I think I probably would have held onto this mascara and retesting it, except that it's a little bit older and it's time to go. But I don't think I'm gonna repurchase it. Again, there are other formulas that I really enjoy more. For example, I told you about the Beauty Bay High Key Mascara. I also love the Ami Cole. I'm really in love with the Cali Ray Come Hell or High Water Mascara. The one from Ritual Defee has also become one of my favorites. And this one just, it got beat out just like the one from Give Beauty. But we're gonna declutter this one and she's gonna go in the garbage because it's an expired formula. Two of them that are not expired, but I am going to let them go. The first one is the CoverGirl Lash Blast Clean Mascara. This one is really good if you like something very light and wispy. It is a very clean formula. It really separates each of the lashes. It's kind of on the drier side. It really gives a very wispy effect. And I like that and I feel like there's a time and a place. But again, I'm looking for intensity. I want to be realistic. This is newer in my collection, so I can probably pass this on to a family member who don't mind sharing cooties with me because this is a newer product to me. And I think I just wanted to test some more like drugstore mascaras and I was probably standing around in CVS kind of waiting for a prescription or something like that. So that's why I picked it up. In addition to that, I also got the CoverGirl Lash Blast Volume. That's the waterproof formula. This one is almost identical in the wand style. It is my preferred wand style. So this one is very nice. It's also very wispy. This is a wetter formula though. It does give more intense volume while being wispy. And this one I definitely considered holding on to. This one I went back and forth on because it was very beautiful. I do like to have a waterproof formula in my collection, but again, this one is going to get passed over for some of the other ones simply because it's just not as intense as I like. So again, going to let this one go so that it can get some love somewhere else because it is not a bad formula. And then finally, the one that I'm gonna hold on to is the Full Sleeve Mascara from KVD. I believe this wound up in my 2023 favorites as a runner up in the mascara category because I thought it was really nice and clean very, very lightweight formula. You barely even feel this going on. It's also a wetter formula. And it's really good for a clean lower lash mascara. But because I had found some of my other favorites, it's the reason that I put this in the chopping block because again, the level of intensity maybe wasn't there, even though this is supposed to give you like extreme volume. But the reason that I chose to keep it, I think is a number of 
things. I think that it beat out all the other ones that were some of my once favorites, like the Give Beauty Mascara, the Simi Haze Mascara. And I feel as though this formula dried out. And as it dried out just a bit, I felt like it aligned with my updated preferences on mascaras more consistently. So that's the reason I chose to hold on to this one. I do really like it. The more this formula dries out, I feel like the better it performs. I just threw on some foundation because I didn't have any foundations in my chopping block. As you may or may not know, I am retesting all the foundations in my collection with my series called Foundation A Day. So they are going into their own separate chopping blocks, if you will. So I wanna move on into concealers. I had quite a few concealers that I threw into the chopping block because 2023 was pretty much the year of concealers and I felt as though I was buying and testing pretty much every launch that was coming out. And there were some hits and there were some misses, but as I continued to test the new launches, I was forgetting about some of the formulas. So I do have four that I went ahead and retested. The very first one was the Very Valentino Concealer. I have mine in the shade LN2. And while I think this was made for neutral undertones, it definitely comes out a little bit yellow or a little bit warm overall. I think the formula is very thin, lightweight, and easily blendable. The problem is it continued to look drier on my under eyes as the day went on, and also it sunk into my fine lines. Not all of my concealers will sink into my fine lines, so I always find it interesting when a formula does, and that's the immediate turnoff for me. I won't keep a concealer if it sinks into my fine lines, even if it's the most hydrating, thin formula, the most beautiful beautiful color correcting concealer in the world. Sinking into my fine lines is just a formula I'm not matched with and that's what this one did. So for the purposes of my own personal use, I am going to declutter this one. However, I'm going to hold onto this one for reference for the time being and this will be the first one of all the products that I went over so far that I'm going to kind of keep in reference at least for the next few months to see you know if I end up using this for any particular reason I highly doubt it but there's space in there because I cleared it out during my declutters in December so I feel like I've got room and this still has some life left in it so for now I'm going to hold on to this one in the reference library but it is technically decluttered from my collection then the next one that I am also going to do the same thing with is the concealer from Gucci. Similarly, this concealer also looks a little bit warm. It has a yellowish tinge to it. This one is in 14N Fair. It is not a bad concealer. Again, very thin, very blendable overall. The biggest thing with this is that it's not a standout formula. It doesn't have an exceptional look on the under eyes. It doesn't seem to overly hydrate them or smooth out anything or even give it that silicone-like finish where it kind of fills in the hollows in my under eyes, which is something that I really like. And sometimes that's in the shade. This is just kind of a, a run of the mill concealer for me personally and what my preferences are. So for that reason, I know that I won't reach for this over the numerous other concealers that I have. So this one is going to join the Very Valentino concealer in the reference library in the closet. But one that I am going to fully declutter is the IRL Filter Finish Concealer from Makeup Revolution. This concealer is supposed to be long wearing. For up to 16 hours, it's supposed to be breathable in a soft matte finish. And I like a lot of things about it. I like how creamy it is. I do like that it kind of has that silicone-like ness about it. It really does kind of fill in the hollows of my under eyes. I like the soft matte finish. I do feel like it's fairly long wearing. Everything is pretty decent about it except two things. It has a pretty strong scent to it and then also it sinks into my fine lines. So I'm going to fully declutter this. I'm just going to pass this along to, you know, someone who's maybe younger or something or someone who might like it because I still feel like it does have a bit of life left in it because it does have a 12 month shelf life on this one. But the one that I really enjoyed was the Catrice True Skin High Cover Concealer. This is supposed to have 18 hours of wear and it's supposed to be waterproof and hydrating. This one has a a little bit of a tackier finish to it and I don't think it's immediately high coverage. I think you can build it up but I tend not to build up my concealers for fear of them being too heavy or sinking into my fine lines but I think that it's nice medium coverage and I think it's long lasting but I think this has a hydrating property about it. It gets more hydrating as the day goes on. It's pretty affordable. I just did a wear test on the foundation that goes with this, the True Skin Foundation. That is absolutely terrible, but I did make a comment that if they had formulated the foundation the way that they did this concealer, the foundation would have been really, really nice. Because I feel like this is a good concealer for not just under the under eyes, but also to spot conceal in 
This one is in the shade 10, 010 Cool Cashmere. So of the four concealers that I tested, this is the only one that I'm holding on to for my own personal use. Let's move on into some setting powders. I had the infamous Laura Mercier Translucent Loose Setting Powder, and I've had this for a while. I wanna say when I started researching like popular setting powders, when I started to build my makeup collection, obviously this kind of came up as the quintessential powder of all powders. I feel like when I had very dry skin, this powder was a little bit too heavy, but now that I have much more oily skin and I can handle a really mattifying powder, in fact, that's kind of what I look for, something more mattifying, oil controlling, long lasting. I thought this would fit into my makeup collection and check way more boxes now that that's my skin type. And while I think it's beautiful on the skin, it doesn't make my makeup last or control my oils. It's not as heavy a powder as I now like. Whereas before, I really couldn't get away with using this. This is just one of those powders that's going to have to stay in the reference library because there may be a time that I end up talking about it, and if I don't, it's a powder, and I feel like I can definitely just pass this on. So this one's not going to stay. I've tried to pare down my powder collection quite a bit, and I only want to reach for the stuff that locks my makeup down, like completely, like really, really intense setting powder. Otherwise, I have some really nice finishing powders in my collection that can kind of do similar things to this. The one that I am keeping that I also have had probably an equal amount of time is the Maybelline Fit Me powder. And I was a little surprised because I thought I was going to kind of go the other way. I thought I was gonna get a bit of a different performance from this one in the Laura Mercier. But in fact, this one, even though it's called a loose finishing powder, sets my makeup down a lot better than the Laura Mercier one does. It just has longevity that that one does not for me and controls my oils a lot more. I feel like this had a lot of popularity for a good reason because it's an affordable powder that performs like high-end and really does a good job. I also think this works for people with a multitude of skin types. Now that my skin is more oily, this works really well. And I remember loving it as well when I had dry skin and it not being too heavy on me. So I think it's popular for a reason. I'm definitely going to hold on to this. In fact, I can tell that I used quite a bit of it when I had dry skin. It's probably about half gone at this point. Here's a better indication. I think you can quite see the line right here. So yeah, this is about half gone. I'm probably gonna put this in a project pan. I have one in there currently, and I was able to finish one of my setting powders off because it's a little bit older. I'm definitely gonna get some more use out of this now that I know that this does a pretty decent job locking my makeup down. Let's move on into setting sprays. I only pulled out one setting spray for my chopping block. I think all else I decluttered and I held onto four different setting sprays. So the one that I had in my chopping block was the Sephora Makeup Setting Spray with 16 hour wear. It's supposed to be transfer proof, sweat and humidity resistant. It has a sticky finish to it and I really liked it when I was wetting my brushes, but it did not make my makeup last. Also like primers, I do not reach for setting sprays that often. And when I do, again, it has to kind of do something additional that a mattifying foundation won't do or a setting powder won't do. And I found this didn't really do anything. Once it dried down, it wasn't transfer sweat and humidity resistant up to 16 hours. It wasn't even for six hours. Sometimes I like to keep setting sprays simply to wet my sponges because I do like the way that it kind of grips with the foundation and really pushes the product like into my skin and kind of makes it grip. Or if I'm just simply too lazy to go get the sponge wet, <laughs> I like to have a setting spray that I can reach for that I don't mind kind of using up. And this would just be one of those. So I'm gonna hold on to this one and keep it here on my desk so that I can just wet my sponges. Hopefully I didn't say brushes because I sometimes say brushes when I mean to say sponges. That's just the way it goes. But yeah, to wet some of my sponges. So I'm gonna keep it up here, but I'm gonna hold on to this one. I wanna say bronzers was my biggest category of things that went into the chopping block. So I have a ton more work to do in the bronzer category. And so for this round, I pulled out four different bronzers. And surprisingly, I am only going to hold on to one of them. So the first one that I have is the ColourPop Super Shock Bronzer in the matte finish in Get Sandy. I have talked on my channel about how the matte version in the Super Shock formula can be a little bit difficult to pick up, but I think if I use a sponge and I dig in there pretty liberally, I can get a decent amount of product, but I'm also liking a little bit less bronzer these days, much more neutral toned, and so for that reason, I feel like this one achieves that. However, this one's just on the older side. I've had it for a while. I've hit pan on it. It's not a ton of product to begin with, and it's easily replaceable. 
I don't know if I'm gonna pass this one on. It's just a little bit older. I'll definitely have to think about it as to whether or not this is gonna go to family or friends, but I am going to declutter this one. The next one that I am gonna let go of, I think surprised me because I initially thought I was gonna keep this. This is the Breezy Cream Bronzer from Tarte in the shade Seychelles. I have not gotten a ton of use out of this one and I initially thought that I was gonna hold on to it because I really enjoy the formula and it even kind of has this reddish undertone to it, which is something that I've mentioned many times. I feel like looks very flattering on fair skin as opposed to something with much more orange pigmentation. However, I just think it's too dark of a shade for me. And I believe Seychelles is the lightest color that they have in this particular bronzer. But I also don't find that it matches my preferences now for a much more neutral tone. And if it has a reddish tone to it, that it's just not quite as pigmented. So I'm gonna declutter this one. I'm going to pass this along to somebody else while this product is still good and someone else can get use out of it. Cause I just, I haven't gotten a ton of use out of it. Along the same lines in terms of shade, I'm going to declutter this one as well. It's the cream bronzer from Lower East Side in the shade Skyscraper. This is a very beautiful formula, something that I received in a boxy charm. Very easy formula to work with too. It's also very opaque and that's both good and bad. The shade for me is just a little bit too deep and the pigmentation is a little bit too intense for what I'm reaching for. So it makes it very difficult to share this product out. And I'm looking for that buildability right now. And I just have a ton of other ones in my collection and a ton more that went into the shopping block. So the realist in me says that I should pass this along to someone else, maybe with a deeper complexion than me. But the final one I am going to hold on to, this is the Huda Beauty Contour and Bronzer Cream in the shade Fair. I have had this in my collection for a while, but it still feels good. This is a little bit of a deeper shade as well, but what this one has that the other two don't, is a level of buildability. You can really go in light-handed with this product the way you can with those other two. And the main reason for that is that this is just a creamier, more emollient formula. The Tarte and the one from Lower East Side are drier. You can really take a fluffy brush with this to pick up just a little bit of product to really airbrush it out where I don't find that that's that simple with those other two products. I don't think the shades are extremely different, but it's much lighter on the skin with this one because it, you can sweep it onto the cheeks very lightly. So I think Huda did a really good job with this formulation. And I believe that it was popular for a while when it was popular for a good reason. And I wanna pull this one back out and get some more use out of it. So I'm gonna hold on to it. I have five different blushes here that I wanna go over with you guys. I can see the sun is like coming in slowly. The first one that I have is the Jelly Dough Blusher from Holika Holika. This one is in the shade Grapefruit Jelly. I have not reached for this in a while, also have had this in my collection for a bit. The airbrushing quality with this blush is quite amazing. It's extremely easy to pick up on a dense brush, even on a fluffy brush, and the way that it airbrushes itself into the cheeks is quite remarkable. It's such a beautiful, easy, simple formula, and I knew that I liked it. I just didn't realize like how well this performed overall. This is again one of those products that just so good in simplicity that I would love to pull back out and get a ton more use out of. And I can tell that I've loved it because there's a decent dip in it. Spring will be upon us very shortly, so I would definitely love to pull this back out. I'm gonna hold on to this one. Such a beautiful putty formula. But let's talk about another putty one that's not gonna stay. This one is from Pacifica. This is the Fluffy Blush. This one is in the shade Sunset. I think this is a remarkable formula pretty inexpensive from the drugstore. I feel like this is a preference thing. You have to kind of like this silicone-based putty formula to pick up on a more fluffy brush, airbrush it into the cheeks. I feel like this really achieves that. The blendability here looks really good. The cloud-like finish that it gives is really good. I had the opportunity and the benefit here of comparing it against the Holika Holika in similarity because of shade and formula overall. And I went into this thinking I was going to keep this blush and I would have, but the opening on this particular glass jar makes it a little bit more difficult to work with because there are only certain brushes that will fit in here. And that's how I like to apply this best. And the Holika Holika one is very similar in shade and formula, and it's much easier to pick up on pretty much any blush brush that I use. So for that reason, I am going to pass this along to someone 
who will get some enjoyment out of it because I think it's an absolutely beautiful formula. Another one that I have here is from Jouer. This one is a hybrid product. It's more like a tribrid product. This is supposed to be a blush, a bronzer, and a highlighter. It's called the Menage a Trois Butter Bronzer Blush and Highlighter in Cessoir. This one is just beautiful makeup. That's what this comes down to. Less about functionality and purpose and more beautiful to look at. There is something very nice in that and satisfying in that we've spent our money on something and it gets to look pretty while it gets to perform well. But in this case, I, I don't have the hankering to hold on to this for its functionality. I feel as though this shade would be great as a multi-purpose product for someone of a deeper complexion. I don't love it as an all-in-one product. I almost do, and I could make it work. I think it would be fine, but I, there are so many other formulas in my collection that I would rather reach for more than this. So I'm gonna pass this along to somebody else who can get more enjoyment out of it. This one from Katkin is in the shade C05. This is an intensely pigmented blush. The reason this made it into the chopping block because it's a very metallic formula. It has a lot of sheen to it. It can double as a highlighter as well. And sometimes it had a tendency to cast a little bit gray on my cheeks. I also have a very different preference in blushes more recently than I did in previous years. I like something that has a little bit more sheen and shimmer to it. I even don't mind something a little bit metallic. I find enjoyment out of it that I didn't in 2022, for example, or the beginning of 2023. I got into much more luminous products, even ones that had a little bit more intense sheen to them. So in retesting this, it's intense. It's highly pigmented. You do have to be careful, but it's now more aligned with what my preferences are. So I'm definitely going to hold onto this one because in terms of the overall finish, this is a fairly unique product in my collection. Rivaling more expensive ones, for example, from Bare Minerals and Iconic London. And both of those formulas made it into some of my favorites of 2023. So I'm gonna hold on to this one for sure. And then the final one was from MAC. This is one of their mineral blushes. This one is in the shade Sweet Enough. This is your quintessential, really soft powder formula blush. This takes no skill at all to apply. It's very airbrushing on the cheeks, very simple formula, something you could easily travel with. I feel like you'd have to find enjoyment out of products that do different different things other than just a kind of matte or finish or you'd have to not kind of enjoy the shade in order for this to be something that just didn't work for you. And there's just simplicity here. I wanted to make sure this was a shade that I really got along with and I, I feel like it has a little bit of warmth on my particular skin tone but it's, it's kind of that basic light mauve shade that's very silky going on. I found a refreshed and renewed enjoyment in the simplicity of this, so I'm gonna hold on to it. For the final category, you guys, I had four highlighters that I pulled out. The very first one is the Star Surfer Highlighter from Kaleidos. At one time, I had a ton of these and I held on to only this one because it was the least shifty. I'm really just not into a shifty highlighter. I do like a pink highlighter occasionally, and I had remembered this being a little bit more on the glittery side, and when I did my highlighter declutter, there were several highlighters that were pink that had a little bit of glitters, and so in kind of swatching them side by side, there were definitely other ones that I preferred in the swatch, but I wanted to make sure this wasn't something that looked absolutely beautiful on the cheeks before I just decluttered it, because swatches don't tell the whole story. In this case, I feel it is a little bit too glittery for me, and I would rather pass this along to somebody who could get more use out of it, so I'm going to fully declutter this one. But the final three I am going to hold on to because every one of them is very seamless. They blend into the skin beautifully. They're nicely shaded. Some of these are a baked formula. And so they provide everything that I really want in a highlighter when it comes to just being something that's extremely simple to apply. The first one is the one from Nabla. This is the Skin Glazing Glass Skin Finish Glow Powder in Ozone. All three of these are intense without being glittery, and while they all sink into the skin beautifully. So they're high-performing highlighters. I want to whittle the highlighter collection down to the ones that do what these three do and get rid of the ones that are a little bit more gimmicky or they sit on the skin or are into the longer lasting or have a little bit of glitter to them. And these three don't do that. So I'm gonna hold on to this one. Similarly, Ofra makes some really good highlighters and I have to give it to them for that. 
This one happens to be an incredibly intense highlighter. This one is in the shade Glazed Donut. Another one that I've had a ton of different shades in, but this is the only one that I've held onto. This is the most intense of all three. It's also the most icy, but I really can't deny the fact that Ofra makes a really nice highlighter. And if I'm looking for something on the punchier side, this is a tried and true formula. It's absolutely stunning on the cheeks if I'm looking for something more intense and it sinks into the skin very nicely. And the very final product and highlighter is from Melt. This is the Digital Dust Highlights highlighter in the shade Stargazer. A similarly smooth, beautiful formula that melts into the skin without sitting on top of it, gives you that really developed sheen without being glittery. This again is just one of those pretty high performing products. Each of them have a little bit of a different shade. So gonna hold onto this one as well. And that is it for chopping block update number one. You guys, I know this video a little bit on the longer side, so I hope you enjoyed. I started with 74, so I still have 44 more to test. There might be a chopping block two and three upcoming. I'd love to hear your comments below about this video or about some of these products in general. I'm out of here for today, you guys, and I hope to catch you all on my next one.